Welcome everyone to Exploring the Mysteries of Soil Biology. This is one of the webinars we are offering in our series of Focus on Sustainability. This webinar series was developed by a group of organizations known regionally for their quality ecological education. By working together, the webinar series enables us to expand the reach of our individual programs. In case you're not familiar with our organizations, they're all nonprofits and largely volunteer groups in the United States. The regional groups are the Ecological Landscape Alliance, the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council, the Midwest Ecological Landscape Alliance, and Ecolandscape California. During the presentation, if you have questions, you can type them in the question window at any time. And we'll be taking one break partway through the presentation for questions, and then another question and answer break at the end as well. And now I would like to introduce Stephen Zion. Steve founded the Living Resources Company and Organic Farm and Community Gardens in southeastern Wisconsin. He later moved to California where he transformed LRC into a horticultural operation, providing organic landscape and garden services to businesses, governmental agencies, and the public. These services include soil analysis, custom organ organic fertilization formulation and application, organic pest management, and educational instruction. He has become known as Sacramento's organic advocate. He has shared his knowledge by writing organic garden columns, teaching at many colleges and universities, and appearing on talk shows regularly in the area. He's been a technical advisor for numerous organizations, holds a science, soil science degree from the University of Wisconsin, is a Wisconsin certified soil tester, and currently is a California licensed pesticide applicator utilizing only organic practices. He's a qualified eco-landscape, eco-landscaper, and a California certified nursery professional. Welcome, Steve. Hi, Penny. Thanks a lot. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to get, uh, speak at this webinar. Uh, we're going to talk about healthy soils and soil biology, and I want to start out by kind of giving you my definition of what a healthy soil is, and I think most people who know about soil biology would agree with most of these things. A healthy soil is a diverse ecological system known as the soil food web. It has nutrients that are available and in the proper balance and in the proper form. It has, the soil should also have an, uh, an abundance of organic matter and humus, the appropriate pH or acidity or alkalinity for the types of plants you're going to be growing. And what a lot of times people neglect talking about is soil structure. We need favorable soil structure in our soil. And if you have all of these factors, you're going to have healthy pest and drought resistant plants. If you have an unhealthy soil, you will more, most likely have pest problems. It all starts with the soil. And what is soil? Soil should be, ideally, about, you know, if it's managed properly, about 50% pore space. And of that pore space, about half of it's going to be water and half of it's going to be air. Uh, I, I'm out in California, and in California we have uh, not only the drought, but normally for about six or eight months, nine months, it doesn't rain at all, so people irrigate all the time. And sometimes they're irrigating every day, and that pore space gets filled up with water. And what we have to realize is that all, all the beneficial critters that live in the soil, including our plant roots, need water, but they also need oxygen. So we, we've got to make sure we have a, a good balance there. Now, in our area, we have about 49% of our soil occupied by mineral matter. Some places uh, in other parts of the country might have a little bit less, maybe 44, 45%. Um, and that mineral matter basically consists of sand, silt, and clay. The only difference between those three things is the size, as you can see in the lower right there. The, there is no difference in the, the nutrient makeup or mineralogical properties, it's only size. And if you figure out the proportion of sand, silt, and clay, you can determine what your soil's texture is, such as a, a clay loam or a silty clay loam or a sandy loam, something like that. 
And a lot of people, when they have a, a, lot, a clay soil or a sandy soil, they want to go more towards that loam, which is in the middle, which is what everybody thinks they want. And it's really important to realize that you should not be trying to change your texture. The, uh, you have to remember what building contractors do with sand and clay. You put sand and clay together and they get concrete. I don't think we want to maintain our gardens and landscapes in concrete. And then in our area we have about 1% organic matter. In your area you might, depending upon where you're from, might have anywhere from, uh, maybe close to 5% to organic matter. Now of that organic matter, about 85% of it is humus or fully decomposed compost, if you will about 10% live roots, and then 10% or 5% of that are the living organisms. They are really the key to making that soil work and having productive, happy, healthy, pest-resistant plants. They make everything work. They are critical. They are the real gardeners. You are the managers of the soil food web, if it will. And the real gardeners are the soil food web. Hopefully most of you are familiar with this photograph here where up in the upper left hand corner we have that nuclear power plant uh, acting on the plants. The plants are photosynthesizing, taking in carbon dioxide, giving off oxygen, sequestering carbon into their plant roots, uh, taking and manufacturing food. Then that organic matter uh, in many cases at some point will die and it will be then eaten by this next middle level uh, of microscopic organisms that are decomposers, the bacteria, the fungi, there's some of the root feeding nematodes, then they're eaten by the bigger guys who are eaten by the bigger guys who are eaten by the bigger guys and, and life goes on. Um, and so that's all well and good, but I think, you know, for me, I like to know, you know, a little more about what the whole function of the soil is. And so we have this next slide known as the poop loop. Uh, the common, you know, name might be nutrient cycling, but the real scientific name is the is the poop loop. And again, you've got your sun there down in the lower left, the nuclear power plant causing photosynthesis, and the plants produce organic matter. Uh, most of that organic matter, before it's eaten by the soil biology, will be dead, and they're eaten, they're eaten by the decomposers, which include the fungi and the bacteria. And what's interesting about these initial decomposers is they accumulate nitrogen. They take nitrogen out of the air that's in the soil and out of the organic matter, and they store it in their body. And so there's an abundance of nitrogen in these micro, little tiny microscopic organisms. Then they're eaten by these bigger guys, these soil pre predators. And these soil predators are not very efficient at using nitrogen, and so what they have to do is get rid of the excess. And so they get rid of the excess as this word right here, poop. And so the, the poop loop begins with these guys, and they're releasing that nitrogen to fertilize the plants. Then they're eaten by bigger predators who are then eaten by bigger predators who are then eaten by bigger predators. And eat all of these guys are increasingly inefficient at using nitrogen, and so we get more and more poop looping. And what's real interesting about most of these guys is the, the, the nematodes, the arthropods, the mites, the, the soil predators, the, the, the microscopic soil predators, they live really, really close to the plants in the plant root area um, in what's called the rhizosphere. And so they're interacting really, really close together in that what's called the rhizosphere. Now I mentioned earlier that soil structure is really important. And if you're not familiar with what soil structure is, it's where you get the sand, silt, and clay particles and pieces of organic matter aggregated together into what are called PEDs. You don't have to, the word PEDs is not important, but they're aggregated together. And usually that's all they talk about. What's really important about this aggregation is the result is you get these different sized pore spaces. Like here in this picture here, this is a really large pore space right here. And so when the rain or the water moves down in here, and while it's raining and you're irrigating, this area will fill up with water. But when the, the water from the top stops, that water here will drain down. 
And, and so the result will be after it stops raining or you stop irrigating, there will be oxygen in here, which is critical for the plant roots and the soil biology. Then you've got the medium-sized roots, which is where the majority of the water that is utilized by your plants and the soil biology stays. And then you've got really small pore spaces in here where the really tiny microscopic organisms can go hide from being eaten by the bigger guys. Now when you have all of this soil structure and you have these different sized pore spaces, you're going to have improved soil aeration. The, wa the, the water, when it, when it hits the soil from either rain or irrigation, is going to be able to move into the soil through those large pores. So you get improved water, root, nutrient, and biological move, uh, mobility throughout the soil. You get a, a better condition. The roots can move through there. The biology can move through, through there. And because the water is running into the soil, instead of running off, you get less erosion, less sedimentation. And with all this, all this aeration and, these, and the water storage and everything, you get a, a really good soil biology in there. You get a really uh, diverse soil food web. And any kinds of organic fertilizers and soil conditioners that you or Mother Nature put on the soil surface when it moves into the soil will get held by that soil biology so you don't get very much leaching, if any. And so the, the, all of the nutrients stay in the root zone of the plants. And also because you have these large pore spaces uh, with oxygen, uh, you're going to have fewer uh, water-related disease problems as well. New, this, the soil food web also makes nutrients available for the plants. They decompose organic matter, and as I showed you in, in that poop loop. They, some of them manufacture nitrogen. They take nitrogen out of the air and the soil. This is why those large pore spaces are important. When, they, when I learned in college that they took nitrogen out of the air, I said, these guys are in the soil. How are they doing this? Well, it's those large pore spaces. And you've got to realize that nitrogen in, 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 our, in the air that we breathe is over 70% nitrogen. And so there's, there's an abundance of that material there. And there are nutrient re reservoir, any kind of organic materials, organic fertilizers, nutrients that, that move down into this soil food web here uh, will get held there. And they will slowly release it into the plant root. And so the plant root can feed. And so here's your soil food web with a, with a happy, healthy soil food web. You've been using organic fertilizers, and it's, it's very, very happy and healthy. And so the plant root can obtain nutrients and water from this huge area. And so this is right next to the plant root, so they're uh, making those nutrients available right there at the right place. They are producing those nutrients in the form of poop, for, for example, uh, which is how Mother Nature has evolved these uh, roots to absorb that material. And they're most active when the plants are most active. So they're producing growth hormones. They're producing those nutrients in the forms that the plant needs when the plant is growing. So they're doing it at the same time. So you end up with improved plant fertility. And then you're going to have improved water storage, utilization, and improved water quality. If you've got imbalances and toxicities and deficiencies of your nutrients, they will help buffer the effect of those. And they can also actually uh, prevent and eradicate pests. And years ago when there were the super, super fun sites back in the 70s and 80s when the US EPA decided we needed to clean up the soil that was contaminated, they employed these soil food web members. So we're now starting to unlock the secrets in the soil. Um, and it's really important to know, I think, what some of these critters actually do. So that I, at, the, at the end of this talk, I'm going to talk about how to manage the soil biology. And it's important to know what these guys do so that when s some chemical salesman comes down the line and says, no, you should use our synthetic fertilizer, you're going to know, well, maybe I shouldn't because it's going to hurt the bacteria or the fungi. And so I'm, I want to go into a little bit of depth of what some of these guys do. Now, the bacteria, these are, are very, very small little critters. And in most cases, they're just one-celled organisms. And they decompose organic matter, and they take nitrogen out of the air and fix it and put it in their bodies. Most of you are probably familiar with legumes. And these are, these are legume roots here uh, from peas or, or, or beans. And they form these little nodules. And those nodules have that bacteria in there, and that bacteria is sequestering nitrogen. They also produce growth hormones. These are nutrient accumulators, so they're storing these nutrients that will be a later available through that poop loop. 
And you can see in this upper picture, they're really tiny. They're these, you know, one-celled little critters. And because they're so small, every, every time you, you irrigate or it rains, they would normally just move right through the soil and leach out. And so what they have to do in order to stay in the soil is produce glues, or what are called microbial glum, gums, to glue them to the soil particles so they don't get leached out of the soil column. And they produce enough glue to actually glue the sand, silt, and clay and pieces of organic matter particles together to create that structure. They also help uh, suppress disease, decompose toxins. Uh, they dissolve minerals making them and, and making them uh, available, such as phosphorus. Uh, then there's actinobacteria. You may have, may have known them as actinomycetes. They changed the name of these guys. They actually found out they were bacteria and not fungi. And they're actually responsible for the majority of the decomp decomposition of organic matter. Now in this picture on the upper right, uh, it, depending upon where you're located, when the weather warms up, and particularly the soil temperatures start warming up, and if you've got a coarse textured mulch like bark, if you turn that bark over when the weather starts warming up and the soil temperature starts warming up, you're going to see all of these white strands. And that's the actinomycetes breaking down that bark or those big chunks. And they are nutrient accumulators again. And they don't manufacture nitrogen, but they liberate a lot of nitrogen from that organic matter stored in their bodies that will be available later. They also produce antibiotics that are useful in fighting off pests in the soil. And if you've gotten, if you've ever gotten sick and taken some of the antibiotics that are available through modern medicine, uh, some, of those mo some of those antibiotics like streptomycin are made from these guys. Um, and there, there also was a discovery not too long ago of a, uh, one of these actinobacteria in a rum distillery in the Caribbean islands. And they found out that this material can be utilized as an insecticide. And it's called spinosad. And one brand is called Captain Jack's Dead Bug. Um, also, these guys are responsible for the, the really wonderful odor of a health, happy, healthy soil. And so when you turn and cultivate that soil, which I'm going to recommend that you don't do, but if and when you do that, um, you'll have that nice earthy smell, and that's the actinobacteria that you're smelling. Then there's Frankie. We've known Frankie existed for a long period of time, but we didn't know what they did. And if you look on some of your California natives, your alder, your birch, your barberry, and, and some of the other plants, you're going to see these strange growths on, on the root structures. And these strange growths accumulate moisture, and they actually are nutrient accumulators fixing nitrogen. They're not legumes, but they fix nitrogen similar to legumes, and they're actually responsible for 15% of all the biologically fixed nitrogen in the soil. And for these plants that have this association, they get almost all of their nitrogen from these specific organisms, from the Frankia. They also protect, uh, protect the soil food web, including the plant roots, um, from, from various pests. They help retain a lot of water. You can see these guys are really, really succulent. This is on a Ceanothus, which is a California native. And so they're, 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 they really are critical to making these plants happy and healthy, in particular the, the California natives, to be drought tolerant and, and perform well. And what, what's happening is uh, California natives are becoming very, very popular because we're in a drought out here. And so more and more people are putting, putting them in the ground. And we're finding out that in a lot of the newer landscapes, the newer homes, uh, these plants are, are not performing very well after two years. And the reason being is what do developers do the first time they go in there to, to create that housing track? The first thing they do is remove the topsoil. And with that topsoil goes all the Frankia. And so now you put in those California natives, and it's not really native soil anymore, and you don't have the Frankia there. And so the pathogens are going to be you know, more successful at hurting the plants. And that water reservoir that the plants have through the Frankia is no longer there. So we do need to um, fertilize these plants more than a lot of the California native folks uh, think so. Then there's fungi. And please realize the vast majority of fungi are beneficial. They, are, they, are, they, they form lots of good things. You might have a couple of bad guys, um, and typically the bad fungi can be managed through changing your management practices. 
But these fungi are, are thread-like structures that you can see in, this up in the upper right here uh, that actually tie the sand, silt, and clay, clay particles and pieces of organic matter together, improving soil structure. They decompose organic matter. They are nutrient accumulators again. And here in this middle picture, here's the fungi and these little globular type materials. That's the organic matter, and they're they're feeding on that organic matter and they're sequestering um, carbon and and nutrients. And they're also really important in uh, pest suppression. One of my favorite um, pictures is this one right here in the lower corner. This is a fungal strand, and, and all of these bumpy things down below, that's the rhizosphere. The root is actually underneath that. And this worm-like critter is a root-feeding nematode, and what that root-feeding nematode do, is doing is it's feeding on the root. Well, the root doesn't like that. So the root picks up its iPhone and calls this fungi and tells the fungi that the nematode's in town, and you've got to take care of these guys for me. Well, okay, they don't have the technology. They don't have cell phones. But they do communicate. The, the plant root will actually exude a particular chemical that will tell this fungi to produce these little rings. They produce the rings. These rings then exude a chemical that attracts the nematode. The nematode crawls inside there, and much like a Venus flytrap, when the Venus flytrap gets a fly in there, it closes up and traps that fly. In this case, they fill up with fluid and trap the nematode. And then they will exude another chemical that will start decomposing that uh, uh, nematode so that they can dine on it. So it, that you really get really good uh, biological control. And if you, and if you really want to see some exciting videos, um, more than the blockbusters in, in the movie theaters, uh, Google search uh, fung uh, nematode trapping fungi. And they're just wonderful little videos that, where, where you see this actually working out there. Okay, and then there's mycorrhizal fungi. Hopefully most of you guys have heard about these guys. They uh, have symbiotic relationships with various plants, um, most of your higher plants, where they will feed the fungus sugar and the fungus, fungus the, the mycorrhizal fungi, will feed nutrients and moisture to the plant. So it's a mutually benefiting relationship. And we're still talking about nutrient accumulators. They're storing nutrients that will be available through the poop loop when they get eaten. Um, now here in the, in the lower left, we've got this really dark portion. That's the plant root. This kind of shaded area, that's the rhizosphere where the vast majority of the soil biology that I've been talking about is living. And then what happens with this mycorrhizal fungi? They will attach themselves to the roots. And then it will extend well beyond the, the normal rhizosphere. So here you've got a plant without the mycorrhizal fungi. They can only obtain nutrients from the area very, very close to the roots. Same with water. Now when you start getting some mycorrhizal fungi in there, now they can get water and nutrients from this increased area. And eventually this whole area will be uh, inoculated with these mycorrhizal fungi. And, and so the plant will get a lot of the extra nutrients and water that the, the plant without that will not get. And a lot of your weeds do not have this mycorrhizal association, so they can, you know, basically help, it helps them outcompete weeds. Uh, as you can see, the, these root-like structures will, are going to tie the sand, silt, and clay particles together. They also sec secrete glues that glue them, uh, the material together. And they help plants communicate with each other as well. Then there's protozoa. The protozoa um, help make large uh, soil, uh, soil pores. Uh, the flagellates here, you can see this little tail here. Uh, they actually move around in the soil. And, and this kind of fuzzy area around the outside, it's fuzzy because there's all sorts of little feet there. And these guys are moving around in the soil, pushing the soil particles around, and creating large pore spaces. Now, these guys are the poopers of the poop loop. We're starting to get into the nutrient dispersers. And uh, so, you know, we're, we're getting to the point where these guys are actually feeding the plants. Then they're nematodes. Uh, the vast majority of them are eating bacteria and fungi, so they're part of the ecological system. They don't do any harm. A few of them are going to eat your plant roots, but if you only have a couple of them, it's not a big deal. 
But what I think is real exciting is, is some of them are predatory in nature. And you can actually go to go uh, in some in some cases to your local nursery, or you can order online beneficial nematodes. Now, if you've ever had problems with skunks or raccoons digging up your turf, in many cases, what they're after is these lawn grubs. And this is a healthy grub, and then uh, this this one here has been attacked by these beneficial nematodes. And here's the the pupa stage. And in this case, the, the nematodes have eaten so much of the inside of that pupa that they, there's not enough room for them. They're, they're, all the space is beneficial nematodes, and they've actually cracked open the, 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 this exoskeleton, and, and they're, they're escaping where they can now re-inoculate uh, other grubs, and the, the pest control can be uh, continued. Uh, they're also nutrient dispersers. Uh, we just had a, a, a rather romantic day a couple of days ago, and, and the boys and the girls wanted to get together, and so one of them would hop on a taxi, and then in this case the taxi is the nematode, and the nematode would take them to the girlfriend or boyfriend for, for a nice evening. Um, so then there are the earthworms. Earthworms are Mother Nature's fertilizer factories. What goes into the earthworm and versus what comes out is seven, seven times more nutrient-rich when it comes out. They mix and aggregate soil. If you've got good quality compost on the surface of your soil, they're going to go up there every single night, feed on that organic matter, and then move back into the soil in the, in the early morning and create um, these channels, which will help improve water infiltration into the soil. They're going to be incorporating that organic matter. That organic matter is going to improve the water holding capacity. Those channels will also prove uh, helpful for root growth. It's going to get the, the roots will follow those channels. And they stimulate soil microbial activity. Now, if you've ever touched a worm, they're really slimy. And the major reason why that slime is there, so for those of you who go fishing, you know it's to make it difficult to put your fishing hook through them. But the, another reason is to help them move through the soil. But another important reason is that slime is food for all of this soil biology that I've been talking about. And so they also disperse soil biology, like what we had with the nematodes, but now we're talking major holidays, and the grandparents uh, want to visit the kids, and so mom and dad pack up the, the, their children, and, and they put them on these worms, and the worms transport them to grandma and grandpa's place. And what's really cool with all that slime, it's like a dining car, so they've got food all the way to grandma's house. And when that worm is moving through, it's depositing that slime on the walls of the soil as it travels through. So when they get to grandmother's house, they're actually providing dinner. They bring dinner. Now, I mentioned Valentine's Day uh, a little bit ago. This, I'm going to try and be politically correct here and just basically say that uh, this picture here in the middle is the end result of a romantic evening in the life of the earthworm on Valentine's Day. And the result of that is this picture here. These are uh, egg capsules of the earthworm. They're going to be anywhere from three to seven earth baby earthworms in each one of these capsules. And you can see in the, the lower right picture, that's a paper clip. So they're pretty small. Now, when I used to work in a local nursery, people would come into the nurseries and bring these guys in, and they'd be saying, well, we've been killing these things by the hundreds in our garden and landscape, and we want to spray some sort of pesticide. We're sick of, we're sick of squishing them. And we'd say, well, these are earthworms, and these are really, really critical. Um, important critters. And so these guys are actually uh, major components in creating a more favorable environment for all of the other critters. Now the soil biology can also help in drought conditions. It improves the soil structure so water um, can move into and through the soil more successfully. It increases the water holding capacity. Uh, for example, if you add, increase the organic matter of your soil by 1%, you increase the available water for the soil biology in your plant roots by 3.7 percent. You're also going to get more developed root systems. This turf grass here is one year old, but it grew in a soil that had a, a wonderful, diverse soil food web. And so you get, uh, with all of these factors, you get the, an increased ability of the, your plants to absorb water, and so less irrigation will be required. Now, Penny, before we talk about how to manage um, our soils and the soil food web. Uh, why don't we see if there are any questions? Okay, we do have a few questions, Steve. The first one is, how does soil pH affect nutrient availability? 
Okay, so so pH depending you know, as as you go up and down the soil pH range, uh, pH of seven is neutral, and as you move down the numbers uh, to six, five, four, you get increasingly acidic, and as you, as you move up, it becomes more increasingly alkaline. And nutrient availability in many of the cases for a lot of the nutrients is dependent upon pH. Uh, out here in California, a big item is the iron. Iron, when the pH is about 5.5, all of the iron is available. But at that point, as you move up the pH range to about 7, when you get to 7, only half of those nutrients will become available, half of the iron will become available. And it's real common in our area to have a pH of like 7.2, and so even less of the iron is available. And so people are seeing iron deficiencies, are seeing yellowing leaves on the new leaves, uh, symptomatic of an iron deficiency, and they're putting more iron down, when in many cases they've got plenty of iron in their soil, and what they need, just need to do is test the pH of their soil, and probably uh, if, if the pH is high, if they lower the pH of their soil, uh, they will uh, open up and make available the iron that's already there. You add iron with a high pH, it'll green up the plants for a short period of time, but then that will get locked up in the soil as well because of the pH. Okay. The next question is, I've read that many earthworms are actually now considered invasive because the most common one was introduced and isn't native to our forests. Clearly earthworms also are good for the soil, as you mentioned. What's the, what's the big picture of this? Okay, um, the, there's, a, there's a big debate in reference to um, invasive species and whether, whether we should be trying to control them or not. Um, the, you know, earthworms, I, in, my, in my personal opinion, I think the, the, the regular earthworms are just so helpful. They, they're, they're really so good. They do so much good. Um, I, would n I would not consider them an invasive species. I would think that they, at this point, have become uh, naturalized and are just so important and critical to, to the ecological systems that, that our plants are growing in. Okay, the next question is, I have clay soil and would like it to be more loam. How much sand should I add and how? <laughs> okay, like I said in the very beginning, you don't want to change your soil texture. Clay is really dominant. If you're familiar with the soil textural triangle, you can take a look, if, you know, you can take a look on, on the internet and do a search and you will see that uh, the, the soil textural triangle is dominated by clay. You would have to add just huge, huge amounts of sand uh, that would be economically uh, not feasible and to, to you know, cultivate that into the soil and mix that into the soil, that's not going to be very feasible and you're going to be destroying the soil structure and then you've got to remember what do building contractors do with sand and clay. They make concrete. What you want to do is say, okay, this is my soil texture, and this will gear, you know, basically tell me how I need to irrigate my soil. But what you want to work on and improve is not the soil texture, but the soil structure, those different sized pore spaces. And if you, if you open up the soil structure, you create that soil structure, you create those large pore spaces, uh, whatever texture you have will, will, will work. Okay. The next question is about nitrogen fixing plants. And the question is, does this take place in the roots through biology in the rhizosphere? Yeah. Um, it doesn't, doesn't always take, take place in, in the roots. Sometimes it's just outside the roots. But it, it, it's all taking place in that rhizosphere, yes. OK. Uh, Totally different topic. What are some of the benefits of foliar feeding? Foliar feeding is wonderful. I, I, I swear by it. Um, anytime the plants are stressed, the roots aren't functioning properly. And so they're not, a, when the roots aren't functioning properly, they're not able to get the nutrition that they normally would get out of the soil. They're not going to absorb the nutrients very, very well. So then they become nutrient stressed. And the more stress you put the plants on, the more susceptible they are to pests. And what foliar feeding does is if you use a good foliar fertilizer that has nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash, has trace minerals, maybe has some biology, 
Um, you're going to make sure that that plant has the nutrition it needs, and so it's not going to be uh, nutrient deficient, and you're going to have a happier, healthier, more pest resistant plant. Um, also, there's been tests shown that by foliar feeding, it actually increases the amount of root exudates, which is the you know the, the chemicals that come out of the roots, like I mentioned with the one that that signals that uh, that fungi to trap the nematodes, and those are like cakes and cookies for the for these the soil biology, and it really still helps to stimulate the soil biology. And then something that a lot of people don't consider when you're talking about foliar feeding is you're walking through the entire landscape and garden. You're spraying this material on all of your plants. And so as long as you don't walk through the garden and landscape with blinders on, you, can, you're, you should be out there observing your plants. And so you can actually conduct an integrated pest management and plant health care inspection and find out, oh, well, this plant isn't looking right. So you stop spraying. You take a look at the plant. You identify and figure out what the problem is, and then you change your management practices to alleviate the problem before it becomes a serious problem. Okay. Well, let's continue on. We have a couple more questions, but let's uh, hold those off until the end Q&A, and let's hear the rest of your presentation before we get to that. Okay. Um, I just want to tell everybody it is 2015, the International Year of Soils. So uh, partake in that, realize that. Now one of the things when we're talking about managing uh, this soil food web is what kinds of fertilizers should we, should we be choosing and applying. And a lot of your synthetic fertilizer folks, uh, the, the, the manufacturers and the reps, will tell you that, that the plants can't tell the difference between a synthetic and natural fertilizer. Um, and they, they don't even discuss whether the, the soil food web can tell the difference. Well, I think there's a little more to the story than they're actually telling you. Now, at fertilizer issues, there, there's one issue is salt. How much salt is in that fertilizer? There are high salt fertilizers, which are most of your synthetic fertilizers and your raw manures. And if you remember from your youth when you ate a, lot, a bag of potato chips, the salt in those potato chips sucked all the moisture, well I won't say all, but a lot of the moisture out of your body and you became very, very thirsty. Salt has an affinity for water and it dehydrates whatever it comes in contact with. Now here in this picture on the bottom, we've got a soil solution in those large pore spaces where the salt concentration is fairly, fairly low and so the water can move into the, into the roots very, very easily and so you've got a normal, happy, healthy looking plant. Now here you put down some synthetic fertilizer or some raw manures and the salt content is relatively high in this material and it's holding on that water so strongly it, the water has a hard time getting into the plant's roots and so you actually get fertilizer induced wilting. And in some cases it can be so serious where the salt is so high that it'll suck the moisture out of the roots and the roots will die and in many cases the plants will die and that's known as fertilizer burn. Now, if it's doing this kind of damage to the plant roots, imagine what it's doing to the, to the one-celled organisms like the bacteria and the fungi. Um, it's, it creates a very, very unhealthy, if not dead, soil food web. The soil food web goes, to, goes, goes away. Um, but then you also have low-salt fertilizers, and these are your natural organic fertilizers that will maintain this condition here where the soil concentration is low and the water and the nutrients will be able to move in there. It's safe for the roots, it's safe for the soil food web, and these natural low salt organic fertilizers actually feed the soil biology. Now another important consideration is the water solubility of these materials. Um, here you've got a, a and most of the water soluble materials are synthetic fertilizers and raw manures again. And because they're water soluble, you, you put them down and you irrigate them or, or it rains and wherever that water goes it takes the fertilizer with it because that fertilizer is now dissolving and moving into the water. And because it's been, it, because these materials are also high in salt, they've killed the soil biology um, and so as a result they're not, the soil is not producing good soil structure, the soil becomes compacted and you get a lot of that water running off and it's taking that fertilizer with it. That fertilizer then goes across the landscape, across the sidewalk, into the gutter. The gutter then leads to our lakes and streams. And so this is where most of those nutrients are going. And then 
if the nutrient, you know, the, the little bit of water that does move into the soil and does take those water-soluble fertilizers with it, here you've got that rhizosphere that we showed you before, and this side um, has been fertilized with synthetic fertilizers, so the soil biology isn't there. It's only very, very close to the plant roots, and so this is where your rhizosphere is on, in this case. And so all the nutrients that are in that water that are passing through here, there's nothing there to hold on to those nutrients, and they move right past and they move into our groundwater, and they're actually contaminating our groundwater. University of California put out this report here a couple of years ago where uh, the nitrogen content in some of our groundwater is so bad that we cannot drink the water. Um, and because this material is, all the nutrients are moving through so quickly, uh, the duration of, of nutrient availability is limited, and so it re requires frequent applications, so your labor costs are going to be involved. And because of the fact that most of it's running off, most of it's mo mo moving past the roots and not getting absorbed, here we've got a fertilizer with 32% nitrogen, but only 2 or 3% actually gets into the plant. So, you know, everybody wants more bang for their bucks, so they're going for those big numbers, but in, in reality, of that 32%, only about 1%, if you're lucky, is actually getting into the plant. It also, these kinds of, this form of fertilizer tells the plants to grow very, very quickly. They grow so quickly, the cell walls don't develop properly, so the cells on the leaves actually exude chemicals. They leak chemicals out that attract things like aphids, white flies, and other sucking insects that are, are then attracted to the plant, and then the cell walls are so thin, easy access, and you get very, very serious um, aphid and pest problems. Um, now, the, on the other side of the coin, you, get water, you have water insoluble fertilizers. These are your organic fertilizers. Because they are not water soluble, and here you, you, know, you can see right on the label here, it's, it says uh, four out of the five percent of this fertilizer is water insoluble. Uh, we'll go back here and only f half of 1% is water insoluble on, on the synthetic fertilizer. And so it's not going to dissolve with the water and wherever the water goes. But because it, it, it's also low in salts, this material is feeding the soil biology. It's creating and improving soil structure so that water and these nutrients can move into, into the soil here, feed all of this soil biology, you get a huge rhizosphere in comparison, and, and the plants will um, do much better. Uh, with this soil biology, more soil biology, if, you've got, if you're growing a lawn and you've got a thatch problem, it'll help eliminate thatch. Uh, it'll, um, allow, uh, it'll prevent groundwater contamination because that, the soil biology will sequester all of these nutrients. And because it's holding these nutrients for a long period of time, you don't have to apply these fertilizers as often. And also, they, these fertilizers will also encourage the plants to grow at their normal rate, so you will have thick cell walls, and they're going to be more pest resistant as well. Um, here's a, a slide from the Colorado State University, and in, uh, what I want to highlight here is the, the, the columns on the right. Uh, the top four fertilizers are synthetic fertilizers, the bottom three are natural and, in some cases, organic fertilizers. And you can see that the nitrogen activity that's available for your plants is only good for four to six weeks with the synthetics and 10 to 12 weeks with the organics. And that doesn't even take into consideration the soil biology. The salt index, the potential to contaminate and, and disrupt the soil food web, is three, you know, two, to, two to four times greater in the synthetic fertilizers. And the leaching potential is high to moderate with the synthetic fertilizers and very, very low. So if we wanted to prevent groundwater contamination, it's not a matter of stopping fertilizing, but changing from synthetic to organic fertilizers. And just I do want to mention that malorganite, they've got it classified as a natural organic fertilizer. It is an activated sewage sludge, which the National Organic Standards state uh, is not organically acceptable. So I would say it's a natural fertilizer, but not an organic fertilizer. Fertilizer. Now, here's a great slide here that kind of shows what I've been talking about. Here you've got on the left, you've got a happy, healthy soil. You've been applying organic fertilizers. You've got a really great, diverse soil food web. And when it rains, it'll take any fertilizers or, or nutrients that Mother Nature has provided, moved it into the soil. Because you've got those large pore spaces, you're going to get very little, if any, runoff. 
and all of those nutrients are going to get sequestered. If you've got any pollutants in there, those pollutants are going to be broken down, and it'll hold a huge amount of water. If you ever, if you really want to get water through to the bottom of this, you've got to add huge amounts of water, and they've actually found that if and when that water does come out of the bottom of the soil column, it'll actually be cleaner than the rainwater that came down from the sky. Now on the other side here, you've got what we'll call dirt. Uh, this is the fertile. This is the soil that you've been using your synthetic fertilizers with the high salts. So you've got very few organic uh, or, or soil food web members, of, or, um, very few microbial life. So there's very little soil structure. So when it rains, your synthetic fertilizer gets dissolved in the water, and because there's no large pore spaces, a lot of it's going to run off and contaminate our creeks and streams. Uh, the little bit of water that does move in there, it's going to take those those nutrients right past the roots. Uh, it'll take clay and move that down and help create a hard pan. And so what actually comes out of the bottom of this column is is really nasty stuff. So we need to to feed the soil food web. We need to stop feeding our plants. We need to feed the soil food web. And the only way to know how to do that is to take a soil test so that you can eliminate deficiencies, toxicities, and imbalances. Here in California, we've got a, a major problem with calcium and magnesium imbalances, and that often is the limiting factor. You need to always use slow-release organic fertilizers, quality organic matter, and you can actually add beneficial microscopic organisms. Good drainage is really important. In a lawn situation, you're probably going to want to aerate when that turf is actively growing. For most of your cool season grasses, that's in spring and fall. Uh, you can also add beneficial soil biology. You need to properly irrigate. That's absolutely critical. Like I showed you in the beginning, we need to have that pore space occupied by roughly 50% water and 50% air. And if you're, if you're overwatering or underwatering, uh, that's not going to be the case. You need to minimize compaction so that you're not crushing those large pore spaces. You need to stay off the ground and keep heavy equipment off the ground, in particular when it's wet. It's more su uh, subject to compaction. You want to minimize or eliminate tillage. Tillage destroys the soil structure, and yeah, it will, it will fluff it up and loosen it up temporarily, but it ends up compacting the soil because you've eliminated all those large pore spaces. And it also destroys the fungi, those thread-like structures, those thread-like critters um, in the soil. And, and by, by eliminating the fungi, there's a ratio between fungi and bacteria that's really important. And you, so you're, you're ending up with a soil that is more dominated by bacteria and fungi. And the kinds of plants that like a bacterial dominated soil are our favorites, the weeds. So that's another reason to avoid tillage. And then you need to avoid synthetic fertilizers and certainly pesticides as well that are going to be uh, damaging to the soil food web. And a gentleman by the name of Justice von Liebig discovered the law of the minimum, which basically means, for example, if you've got nutrients in your soil and you're trying to feed your soil the proper nutrients, you can add all the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash you want, but in this case on the barrel on the left, the, the nutrient that is most efficient in causing the limiting factor is calcium. And so until you add more calcium, uh, all the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash you add isn't going to really make any difference because what's affecting plant growth is the lack of calcium. So how do we test the soil? You can go to the, your local nursery or online and get one of those little soil test kits, but they only test for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash, and pH. You, as you can see here, if you choose a lab, they're going to test for a lot more than that. And in many cases, it's one of these other factors that is limiting growth for your uh, your plants. And when you're choosing a soil lab um, or soil testing service, it's really important uh, that you take a look at what their uh, you know, what their recommendations are like. First, you want to make sure that the recommendations that they are providing are organic. You want to make sure that they are providing um, and have experience with uh, making recommendations for landscapes and gardens. Uh, most of the soil testing services, most of their work is with farms, and the management practices are dramatically different, so the recommendations are going to be different. And then how useful is that report? A lot of people will, will, will you, you know, go with, this, with the least expensive soil testing service, and this is, in many cases, uh, a, a sample of what the soil report might look like, and it's just a bunch of numbers. And then the recommendations on the bottom are, are minimal. 
And so, yeah, you didn't spend a whole lot, but what did you learn from this SOAR report? And typically, it's, it's not very much, if anything. Um, what you want to do, utilize is a soil testing service such as this, where they will use descriptive terms that you can understand. They might have bar graphs that will show you, well, okay, the organic matter, is it on the low side of low or is it on the high side of low? Uh, this company talks, actually talks about soil classification, in this case, uh, San, uh, Joaquin Sandy Loam, and they'll talk about, well, uh, you know, you only sampled six to eight inches down, but there's a light, in, in many cases, there's a hard pan at 24 inches down. We'll talk about, they'll talk about how to properly irrigate. They'll talk about how to feed the soil food web. And then they'll talk about how to manage all of these uh, various nutrient issues. Um, you want to utilize these low salt water insoluble fertilizers. The more different kinds of food you get, the more diversity of the soil critters you're going to have. And if you remember uh, ecology, the more diverse the ecological system is. Uh, the fewer pest problems you're going to have. You can add beneficial soil biology, fewer aerob or aerobic compost and compost tea, worm castings. A lot of these commercial fertilizers have beneficial soil biology in them now. There are products that you can purchase that have the biology in, in them. You want to add to the top of your soil as a mulch or top dress, compost, earthworms, uh, humates, and if you're growing along, you want to practice grass cycling. Uh, leave the clippings there. Um, you want to apply these fertilizers in the spring and the fall. Uh, this is when the microbes are most active and they will be able to do the most absorbing of these materials and then re-releasing them to the plants. And then afterwards, I like to apply a, a foliar fertilizer using something like fish, seaweed, and a compost or worm tea that will increase those root exudates that I talked about earlier feeding the soil food web. Also important to realize that the, the roots not only absorb water and nutrients, but the energy of the plant, about 10 to 40 percent of the food that that plant manufactures goes into these exudates that feed the soil biology. And they actually will communicate and regulate the soil biology through these exudates. And it's absolutely vital for the, the plant health and pest protection. And if they didn't communicate with the soil biology, uh, life on this planet would not exist. It's really, really critical. And so if you think that, this, you, know, you know, you're a vegetarian and you think you're a vegetarian because of the fact that these are lower forms of life, they can't even communicate with each other. Well, they can communicate with each other and they can communicate with, with other critters in the soil, not only other plants, but other critters. Now for resources, um, one of my favorite books that even though the non-soil scientists can learn a lot is Teeming with Microbes by Jeff Lowenfeld and Wayne Lewis. Uh, if you purchase this book, make sure you get this revised edition. Uh, there are some critters in here that are uh, added to the original version that we, we're, we're still learning. We know about more about what's in outer space and what's in the depths of the ocean than we know what's right below our feet. And then a really good book is called Soil Biology Primer by Dr. Elaine Ingham, who did almost all of the research on the soil food web. And that actually is available free online. Just do a, a Google search for that. Now, soil gets no respect. You get your face rubbed in it. You get your name dragged through it. You can be older than it. And it's sold as a commodity. Soil has value. A healthy soil has value. Here in the United States, everything's dollars and cents. And so soil has value. It improves nutrient availability, soil structure, environmental quality, plant health, pest resistance, transplant survival, drought tolerance. And in the pocketbook of our landscapers and gardeners, it reduces inputs of water, fertilizer, and pest management. So there's actual dollars and cents involved in having a, having a happy, healthy soil. We need to cherish our soils. We owe our lives to the soils. It's a diverse, complex ecological system that demands our respect and care. One of my favorite authors, Aldo Leopold, in a Sand County Almanac wrote, land then is not merely soil. It is the foundation of energy flowing through a circuit of soils, plants, and animals. We abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land, as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. And that's it. And I think we've got time for some questions. Excellent. The first question uh, is a reference back to your, the first half of your talk, 
how can we restore the soil's population of Frankia? That's, that's a great question. Um, you cannot go out and purchase Frankia. Um, so what you basically need to do is go to an area that has been undisturbed, where the topsoil has not been removed, where there are plants that typically grow in association with the Frankia, and then ask that owner of that land if you can purchase or be given some of that soil. And then you excavate some of that soil around those plants where they would have that association where the Frankia is, and then you take that back to your garden and landscape and inoculate your soil with that material. What sort of volumes are you talking about? The more the better, <laughs> but it, 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 you know, it's not very practical. Um, another thing you could do is you could uh, add that to like a compost tea, and that would increase the, you know, the amount of Frankia that are growing in that area, and then you would, could spray that onto your soil and water it in. Now, when you're, when you're trying to inoculate your soil with a compost tea, you, you need to apply it to a moist soil, and then you need to water it in really good so that it gets into the soil. A lot of these soil biology, if you, if you leave them on the surface of the soil, uh, the sun will, will kill them. So you need to get them into the soil with, with, with some really substantial, uh, adequate irrigation. Okay. Next is a salt question. What defines high versus low salt? Um, that's a good question, and, and it's really hard to to describe. Um, but you, it, there there are different kinds of salts. It's not it's not like it's not like table salt uh, that you would normally have. Um, but the you know the it's it's all done in a lab. I don't work in a lab. I'm a pedologist. I work out in the field, and so I I can't really get to the the nitty gritty as to how they do that. Um, but as you saw in that, that chart from Colorado State University, uh, it can be determined in a, in a laboratory. Okay. And, and the organic fertilizers are low in salts, and the synthetic fertilizers are high in salts. And all you've got to do is, um, you know, dump a bag of, of organic fertilizer uh, at three or four times the application rate in an area, and the plants will do just fine. Uh, you do the same thing with a synthetic fertilizer, and those plants, because of the salt content, will burn up. Okay. The next question is, is there a definition of good or ideal soil that's the same across the world, or does this different, differ from region to region? Uh, you can have soil different and, and be good uh, just throughout your own, your own garden and landscape. It varies tremendously. Um, there's a there's a wonderful uh, traveling soils exhibit um, that's put out by the Smithsonian Institute called Dig It, and uh, it's it's it shows the the different soils in all of the various states and how dramatically different they are. And uh, I do soil testing, and I remember one client, their soil was dramatically different from the front yard to the backyard because we live in, in an area where there's lots of rivers and before we put the levees in there was a lot of flooding and her backyard regularly got flooded and her front yard did not. So there is not a uniform soil all across the world. It, it tremendously different. Okay. Uh, the next question is, if you're eliminating tillage, what aeration techniques do you suggest? Um, in, in the, in a lawn, typically the only place that you normally would have to aerate would be a lawn. Lawn naturally compacts the soil. And so I like to utilize a, there, there are different kinds of aerators. The one that I like to use you typically only has three or four tines, and the tines work on a crankshaft. And they're hollow tines, and so they take and remove soil cores and they deposited them onto the surface of the lawn. So it looks like you had a, a lot of really sick dogs uh, running over your lawn and landscape. And, and it's really important to remove those cores the, because if you, there are some aerators that are solid spikes. Um, I know that they used to see them in, in garden catalogs and they're probably still there. Sandals that are solid spikes that you can wear that they say aerate your soil. And those solid spikes 
they do create an air channel, but what they're doing is the, where that air channel was, they've now compacted the soil that was there into the walls of that channel. So they're actually compacting the soil. And I like these, these, these smaller machines that use the crankshaft because they're very, very light. They're, so that you're not compacting the soil. Um, a lot of the aerators utilize these big drums, and they fill these drums with water to give the weight, uh, enough weight to the machine so that the, they're called spoons will move into the soil. And so the machine is kind of compacting the soil while it's aerating. Plus the, the advantage of the smaller machine where it's only three or four times, if you're doing this commercially and you're moving your, that, your, that aerator from one location to the next, unless you clean out all of those cores, any kind of weed seeds, weed seeds, disease spores, and insect eggs that are in that soil, you will then inoculate that next customer with those uh, pests. And it happens all the time. And because, you know, typically they'll have 100, 200 of those spoons and nobody's going to clean those. It, it's just too much work. And when you've only got three or four times, they're very, very easy to clean. Okay. We have a couple of questions about close examining the soil food web and soil biology. What sort of microscope do you recommend to take a look at the soil biology? Um, I, I can't speak to that, to be honest with you. Um, but you can go to the soil, I think probably the soil, if you do a Google search for the soil food web, Dr. Elaine Ingham um, actually teaches classes. And, if, and what you really want to do is find out um, when she's teaching class. But she's also got information on her website as to uh, what kinds of microscopes to purchase. Um, she might even uh, suggest places to purchase them. But her courses are really nice because she will actually show you through the, through the slides of what all of these various critters, and, and there are a lot more than I was, that, that I had time for, uh, what they look like. And, and there, there are lots of bad guys in there as well, in particular when you get uh, too much water in your soil, you get the anaerobic conditions, and all the good guys die, and it's just the bad guys that are left. Um, and so I would, I would uh, pass that information off to, or that question off to Dr. Elaine Ingham. Okay. And I see that we're running out of time, so we're going to take just one last question here. Can webinar listeners contact Living Resources for soil analysis and recommendations? Yes, they can. And my information is here on that, on that slide there. PO Box 76, Citrus Heights, California, 95611. And uh, my email is bugs at organiclandscape.com. Well, thank you so much, Steve. This has really been fascinating, and you've given us a great deal to think about as we manage the soil in all of our landscapes. Uh, thank you again, Steve. Goodbye, and good gardening to you all.